welcome Daniel to this is workshop by Daniel Slutsky on machine learning for pipelines. Thank you, Elena. Um, so um, today we are continuing our, our workshops and what we uh, will do is have a very basic introduction to Cyclogemen, uh, this library by Carsten Bering, who is here with us today. And uh, Cyclogemel is maybe the biggest change in the closure data science stack in the last few months. It has been growing uh, very rapidly and gaining lots of additions and, and polish and, and changes. And it has been transforming us in re-understanding what is doable and what is nice to do with data. And um, uh, what we'll do today is just a little taste of it, of like the core ideas. And we already know we will not get to everything we hope to do. Um, and uh, there are some plans to have more advanced workshops and probably it should be like a series of a few sessions to learn more about this library. And um, we will assume only knowledge of closure. So if there is anything that is not clear, that is kind of unexplained, then please just stop me. It would be used, it would be good to use your voice. And um, yeah, and are there any comments so far? Um, uh, any thoughts about this or hopes for this session? Um, Maybe I'll share my screen and um, and we will look into it. Uh, I was just wondering, is, is it possible to get a, uh, uh, um, a link to your code uh, so we can yeah. try it at the URL and maybe- Yeah. Don't... Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and yeah, yesterday uh, yesterday's code still needs some polish. So I, that is why I didn't publish it. But for today, I'll share it really in a moment. And um, yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, oh yeah, and Carsten is sharing some uh, better links in the chat. And yeah, so here I share the screen and here we are. And you see there is this repo of November workshops that has a few of the workshops uh, uh, codes. And so this uh, subdirectory contains some code for today. And probably it will evolve during the session. And, oh, I lost, oh, here we are. Here is the Zolip chat for that. So maybe I'll put uh, the link here. And also in the Zoom chat, as uh, also useful. And yeah, but as much as you can, please use Zulip. It has proved useful in kind of following up on topics. And yeah, maybe let us close this. And here we are. Uh, yeah. So, um, great. Uh, so uh, this uh, small demonstration we will see is uh, something that is based on a research by Sami Kaldinen and Ethan Miller, who will give a talk uh, based, on, based on similar explorations in the reclosure conference. And uh, their, their goal is to kind of give an overview of a few parts of the emerging stack of libraries. And here today we'll focus mostly on CycloGML, this library for machine learning pipelines. And uh, maybe uh, we'll kind of go through the setup a little bit and see what, well, what we have there and kind of what problems we are trying to solve. We'll just try to solve, to solve some small prediction problem. Uh, and maybe we'll succeed more than we succeeded in the last couple of days uh, working with this data. We'll see. And um, yeah, uh, maybe if it is okay, maybe. Uh, does anybody wish to say a little bit about your background, about your relationship to this topic of machine learning so that we get a feeling of, 
of what you hope to hear in this session. Hi. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Amr. I'm from uh, uh, the US, uh, currently in northern Vermont. Uh, I've been a closure programmer doing back end stuff, uh, but this uh, data science stuff is like very new to me. So I'm uh, excited that the only uh, assumption that you have is uh, closure. So look forward to learning a whole lot of stuff here. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, any more comments like that? Or? Sure, uh, I'm JF from Canada and uh, I have uh, taken a few machine learning courses uh, online uh, over the years, but I've never really used it. So I forget pretty much everything I learned. It's like, <laughs> so this is a good refresher for me. Thank you. Uh, I'm familiar with Clojure as well. I'm, uh, I've, I've been programming Clojure for close to 10 years now. Um, as a hobby mainly, but uh, it's my language of choice, definitely. Thank you. Great, that helps. So and if anybody wants to say anything, then please stop me now or later. It would be good to kind of hear your thoughts. And uh, great. So, so uh, what we are, doing, are going to do is to look into data of the Klojurian's Zulip chat, which is this place where a few of us are having our work on the open source uh, closure uh, ecosystem. And um, you see this chat has this structure of streams, uh, like uh, all these streams, like this stream we're at of the November workshops, and also topics under the streams. And you see people are writing messages there. And we have a certain data set that uh, Sami Kallinen uh, collected from the Zulip API of all the messages. And uh, I didn't push this data, data set to the repo because uh, you know it kind of contains, contains this content of the messages. But what we have at the repo is a certain file of like condensed information that of like initial processing that has some data from these messages, like their timing, which is so interesting. So the question we hope to uh, be looking into is how much time it takes to get a response to a message um, in, uh, in this uh, platform. Um, and let us see how we go about that. And uh, so maybe let us first look uh, into this um, uh, data set that we have. So you see it is a table, a table of messages. Uh, so if each row is a message and you see the stream and the topic and the ID of the person sending the message and some timestamp. And now we have all kinds of uh, columns or features as they are called that were, were added uh, by Sami Kaldinen uh, doing some sentiment analysis of the content of the message. I uh, will not go into this field called sentiment analysis unless anybody may wish to comment about it. What Sami did was basic counting of certain words that have some meaning in them, like words of joy uh, are counted in this column, right? Uh, and so these columns may give some information about the content of the message that we just dropped. And uh, Ethan also added this column that says, was this uh, message a question or did it contain a question mark anywhere in the text, right? So we have these additional columns. And what we're interested in is mostly timing as we will see in a moment. Um, yeah, and then um, there is this nice function uh, from Ethan and Sami's uh, uh, research where they were measuring uh, how many seconds passed since the last time a different person was, was writing something in the series of messages. So I will not go into the code, uh, even though it could be interesting. Just this idea is kind of central to what we're doing. We're looking into the time that has passed since we had a message of another person. And the idea is that if we are looking into these gaps of time, 
in a given conversation, and yeah, we need to say what the conversation is, then if we are in this context of a given conversation, then uh, we could look into these times as if they are the times of response. So you see, we can look into our topic thread of this meeting. So you see, um, uh, uh, Peter wrote something, and Carsten wrote something a few hours later. So we will be very simplistic and assume that Carsten was responding to Peter, even though it is not correct in this case, right? It was, these were two separate messages. But that is the very simplistic idea we will practice now. The idea that if somebody is writing a message after another person in the same topics thread, then it is considered to be a response. And I guess it might be useful, this concept, where, you know, you could imagine you're writing something and you are hoping to get a quick response or just a quick message by anybody on the same conversation. So is that idea clear? Because it is kind of our goal now to look into these uh, intervals of time. Any, any thoughts or comments about this uh, simplistic idea of response time? All right, so here, for example, my response time to Ryan was 11 minutes because I, that is the time that has passed since another person wrote a message, right? Mm. Okay, so, so that is what we're doing. And then it is very typical that we take our data set and we are adding many columns and and that, that is this uh, addition of columns to the data is sometimes called feature engineering. It is the idea that we are adding more ways to look into our cases. And we call these features, uh, the uh, columns that we're adding. Uh, so they, they allow us more ways to, to think about uh, or to describe the cases, which are the rows. So, and you see, so for example, um, let us take some example here. So, uh, for example, there is an additional column added called response time, which is computed using this uh, second since different sender function we saw above, right? And, uh, and maybe let us not go into the details because that is not the topic of today, but basically we are adding columns that allow us to look into the data and in a more enlightening way. And you see, we, we are doing all that in table cloth, this library that we had in other workshops for working with tables. And um, we are doing all these additions of columns after grouping by, stream and topic. So we are computing all that in the context of a given topic inside a given stream, like we have here in the Zulip view on the right, right? So it is not the time series of all messages, but rather the messages in a given topic thread, which is considered a conversation, right? So that is what we're doing here. And, um, and you see, we're adding all kinds of columns. And then we are ungrouping because some of our transformations do not need the, this uh, grouping of the data in the, to the context of um, computing uh, in the context of a conversation. And then uh, uh, we look into the sender idea, uh, the sender ID, the, the ID of the person sending the messages. And the problem is that there are many people who wrote very few messages. So we took only the most uh, 30 frequent message senders. And uh, if, you know, if anybody who is not one of them is sending a message, we'll consider the ID minus one. So that will not have these uh, very um, uh, uh, less frequent senders uh, uh, to, ha to handle. So, and we call this safe sender ID. And then we are just taking the data from the beginning of 2019 because 2018 had very little data. 
another detail here was that we are dropping all the cases where we didn't have response time, which means all those cases where a person was writing after their own message, which are less interesting for our question of response times. So that was like a quick look into some feature engineering, as it is called. And it is typical that when you have a data problem, you will do something like that, add some columns. Let us see how this uh, data set looks. So you see, we just got more columns, right? And we will use some of them. And is it, is it okay? Or any thoughts about this, any comments? So we have a data set with more columns. And um, yeah, and we look into, for example, this safe sender ID, you see that there are those 30 people who have been writing the more, the largest number of messages. Could and you the text a little larger, somebody else? Oh, yeah, thank you, yeah, yeah, good idea. Thank you so much, yeah. And so you see, uh, these people were writing more messages. And this minus one is all the other people who, that we want, don't want to kind of um, have in, in our machine learning process uh, in this uh, granularity. And, um, great. So now let us prepare to do some machine learning. And our hope is to look into um, uh, this special column called um, next response time, which is the next value of the response time, and to be able to predict it. And next response time is just the response time shifted inside conversation. So maybe let us actually look into it so that we get a feeling of this number. This column is special because it is looking into the future. And let us see that in a moment. So. Um, let us, um, uh, yeah, let us, uh, for example, take this example. What are we doing here? We are taking, maybe let us take these messages with the features. We, we will group by stream and topic. What happens when we do that? We're getting this uh, grouped data set, which has kind of a nested structure of tables inside the table. We discussed that a little bit yesterday, and so maybe on another workshop we dive into it more. But the idea is that you see, for every stream and topic, we have a whole data set of all messages of that stream and that topic, and it is a nice table cloth notion. This idea of grouping, so we can take the data column which has those groups. So we can take the data column. So this data column is just a sequence of data sets for all the specific groups. And we'll take just the first one. So the first one here is the hello topic under the data science stream. And you see it has those, those uh, all those messages which were just in this topic, right? And it is, uh, this topic is kind of special because that is where people are introducing themselves for the first time. So maybe it's not a typical conversation. And now you can see uh, this column called response time. That is the time since the message of the previous sender. Let us maybe just select the relevant, the columns that are interesting to us. So um, we will use tablecloth, select, columns, or maybe, yeah, and we'll select um, response time uh, or a next response time, and also maybe the previous response time, which is another shift of the response time. And let us look into this. And you see, it is nice. Tablecloth allows us to do data transformations inside the groups, and it is kind of by default, it acts inside the group. Uh, the groups, which are those sub data sets. So here we have these three columns. And you see they are shifts of each other. Maybe we will or reorganize it so that it is easier to see. So the previous response time 
is the previous value of the response time. And the next response time is the next value of the response time. Is it okay? Um, um, so um, this next response time is special because it is looking into the future, right? This number wasn't known when this message was sent. It will be known in the future where the next message will be sent here. So that is the thing we want to predict. Right? And the other columns are things which are known when the message is sent. So we can use them for prediction. Right? And this distinction is kind of um, uh, important in fire in time series forecasting, right? That we can know what is known at a given time and what is not known. Uh, and so another column that looks into the future is this uh, column called, uh, oh, sorry, I was lost for a moment. This column called um, active. What active is looking into is comparing the next response time to a given threshold. And here we're using this uh, functional namespace from the dtype next library that allows to compare arrays, uh, to, or to, sorry, to compute functions over whole arrays. So we are doing this comparison. And again, we'll not focus on dtype next here today, but what we are checking is whether the response times are smaller than some constant called quick response threshold, which is just the number of seconds in 10 minutes. So active, this column called active, is again looking into the future and asking, will the next response, which is the next message by another sender in the same topic thread, will it be in the next 10 minutes. And that will consider conversation being active. Right? So it is an, a nice prediction question asking, if I'm sending this message now, will the conversation be active? Which means, will I get this response in 10 minutes? Right? So, uh, so these were some columns we are computing. So that is kind of the setup. And we got a little taste of tablecloth and dtype next. Really, I know it is a little bit quick because it is not the topic of today. But maybe I hope it gives a little taste of, of those initial steps of setting up a machine learning uh, problem we're going to look into. Um, is it good? Um, yeah, and now in a moment we'll go about things which are more related to machine learning and we will mostly use the CycloGML uh, library. Uh, I'm looking at the chat to see if there are any comments. No, no, no comments here. And um, and cast and please, of course, stop me at any time because probably you will have a lot to say about the very basic things I will be doing. Um, great. So, yeah. Uh, somebody may wish to say something. Oh, I see a comment. In sure, the chat. I have a quick question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, what what size of uh, what size is your data set in this case? Is it it's probably uh, trimmed down just for the presentation? Uh, uh, how many records do you think there are, there are? Let us check. So here is these messages with features, and you see it has ten thousand messages okay and, the, uh -huh. these are all the messages in just a few streams in zulip that sami uh, picked and we are skipping uh, subsequent messages of the same sender so these are all the messages of a new sender compared to the previous message in a given topic Okay, thank you. Uh, so my my the, my main question was the uh, the closure code you use to uh, massage and clean up the data. Yeah, it's mostly uh, 
uh, I guess I saw the very first uh, uh, function looked like it was doing a, a traditional sequential reduce prepared messages, for example, or second since different sender that was using uh, map reduce reverse. Yeah. Uh, is, 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 if the, 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 the data set was huge, much huger, let's say you were going over a billion records, would, would you have to resort to a different approach to, to write seconds since different sender? Possibly, yeah, let us see. So for example here, um, what we see is that we are using this threading macro to map and reduce and reverse and map second. And at least some of these things could be using transducers. Yes, but even, even if you were using a transducer, would that be enough if the data set was uh, truly massive? Do That's a good question. Yeah, um, we didn't face this problem here. I think transducers in some situations can be very fast. And, um, you know, they, as we learned in the transducers talk, they can enjoy the JVM's uh, just in time compilation uh, uh, optimizations. And sometimes they turn out very efficient. Um, but still, uh, there are things here that we might improve. For example, here we are creating a vector just in order to pair two values together. So possibly we should have used another thing here just to avoid this creation of a data structure, which is a little bit heavy. And typically that, these are the optimizations one would make when needing to look into a bigger problem, which is not our case at the moment. Uh, so we didn't do it. But yeah, I think this code could be optimized in a few ways. But uh, in the, the, but the, uh, the, the main idea, would you say is that uh, we cannot really do vector operations in this method because you need to relate different columns to each other at the record level. Is that correct? Um, I think it is not obvious. Uh, so it, it is indeed it is a sequential uh, computation that could be called stateful in the sense where you are not uh, very local in your computation, just looking at a given element at every time, but actually at some aggregation over a few previous elements of an un and possibly an unknown number of previous elements, right? Because, for example, we are looking to find uh, the next message oh. of the previous me message of a different person. So Sorry. doing that. Um, with, uh, without sequences, with more efficient data structures like Java arrays is possible if we can bound the number of elements, but it will be a bit more involved in terms of implementing. So I wouldn't do that if I'm not facing a performance problem. But yeah, there will be a gap. And we see that there is a gap between uh, sequential computing using transducers to array-like processing using uh, the type next. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that, that is important to kind of remember these things. Uh, that, and, you know, typically many of the other things we are doing here are more of the array processing kind as you hinted and they are faster. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so now we are about splitting and, and we discussed this a little bit for those of you who were yesterday, but I think this, because this part is related to machine learning workflows, we should discuss it today too. And the idea is that typically when you have, when you want to do machine learning or at least that flavor of machine learning that is called supervised learning, you need to take some data to learn something from them. And then you may wish to apply what you learned to another data in order to test the performance of, of it over new data. So you can see whether what you have learned can generalize be beyond the data you have learned from. 
And uh, the most basic thing to do uh, in order to have that is dividing the data into a so-called training set and test set. And typically you will divide more. You will take your training set and divide it more into subsets uh, for, your, uh, for a more involved training and evaluation uh, setup. But just for now, let us divide just for training and testing the data. And uh, maybe we should comment about the namespaces we are using here. Um, you see, uh, we are requiring many namespaces, and some of them are from this CycloGML library, and some are from a few other libraries, and most of these other libraries are actually contained in CycloGML. CycloGML is a library uh, by Carsten Bering, that, which is um, coupling a few things, sorry, it is collecting a few libraries together in a co coherent way that allows to use them together. And it is offering some reorganization of some of the functions in new namespaces so that you may need to remember less of these namespaces. And I think if you look into the nice CycloGML tutorials that Carsten shared in the chat, then um, you will see, or maybe this, yeah, you will see that you can use not too many of the namespace says, thanks to this um, reorganization that CycloGML is offering. And here we will use sometimes that and sometimes uh, those other libraries, which are more internal, so to speak, um, maybe just by habit. And so maybe we could have been uh, more thoughtful about these choices and, uh, Anyway, here we will still use um, tablecloth, uh, even though some of these functions you may find also in, in CycloGML, I think. And so um, what we want to do is to divide our data into training and testing, a training set and a test set. And there is a basic way to do it with this, um, split function in tablecloth. Let us try just for a moment before we are doing this more involved process. So you see, you could have some data set like uh, x, uh, h, i, y, something like that. So we have a data set. Right. And this data set, we can now split it um, using this table plus function called split. And it has some options. Maybe we'll not discuss it now. One of the uh, following a comment of uh, one of the friends here yesterday, we pick the seed so that we can control the randomness in a reproducible way. Let us not dive into it now. But you see, when we do that, we get a new column that is called the split name, either train or test, right? So um, this way we get this, this additional splitting uh, uh, in, a data, in a table structure. And since we use the seed, if we do it again, we get the same results, right? And uh, this seed is used for initializing the random number generator, which is this stateful object that is used for generating pseudo randomness in our process. And so, um, so that is this th function we are using here, but you see, we are doing a little more. Why are we doing more than just that? Right? Why is all this elaborate process we are doing here? So the idea is that we need to think we need to think how to divide our data into training and testing in a way that will be useful for our learning process. So in our case, we want to think about conversations. And a conversation you could think about is maybe a conversation is something you could consider as a, a given topic thread in a given day, right? That is a little bit simplistic, of course, but maybe just for the sake of this session, let us 
Imagine that that is the notion of conversation we are using, a given topic thread in a given day. And then you wouldn't like to break your conversations into both training and testing. You wouldn't like a single conversation to be split in a way that where some messages are used in training and others are used in testing. Why wouldn't you want that? So um, one reason for that is, or maybe somebody may wish to comment about it. And yesterday, but there were a few interesting comments about other ways to split. And certainly what we are going to do now is not the only way to split the data. But that, does anybody wish to comment about uh, the splitting? Or is, is the problem we are facing, is it clear? Uh, well, essentially, if you do that, you're corrupting your, uh, your testing data because uh, when time comes to test your model, it will have been given the next response times of the testing set in advance in those partial conversations. Yeah, yeah, so that is one thing. And even if we solve that, as we possibly did here, because we have already computed the response times before splitting, right? There is another problem, except for possibly corrupting the data and making it unreasonable. Um, what is the other possible problem here in taking the same conversation and splitting it to training and testing. So the other problem that might happen here if we are not careful in selecting training and testing sets is the so-called idea of leakage or data leakage that uh, in the context of machine learning. And what this notion means is that sometimes, you know, you are, uh, seeing your training set and you see some phenomena in the training set, which are not just the very specific circumstances that were there that could be very extreme, could not all of them are actually things we can learn from in a more general sense. For example, maybe there was very one unique conversation, which was, you know, people were getting very excited there and there wasn't any other conversation like that, but it is kind of taking a decent part of the data because it was long, right? So special things can happen and not all of them generalize. What happens if we take that same conversation, which is very extreme in behavior and use it both for training and for testing? In training, it will bias your model to assume that some conversations can be very much extreme. In testing, it will kind of approve that learning that was useful, even though that is actually the same conversation, which was just very active for some time. So this is so-called leakage, and it is typically we would like to avoid that. And um, uh, that is why what we'll do here is assign each given conversation either to training or to testing. And similarly, if we have a geographical uh, data problem, we may wish to take any neighborhood or street or local situation and assign it either to training or to testing and not mix the two. It depends very much on your domain, on the specific problem you're looking into. But this kind of reasoning is something you need to do when you're building your setup for machine learning. And this is just a little hint of this kind of thinking that is needed. And probably some of you may have some interesting comments now about how I could split it differently. Um, any comments so far? Mm. Great, so maybe we'll not dive into the code and see why it does what we intended. Um, one thing we're doing here is actually uh, removing some um, problematic data rows where uh, the response times did not make sense. These were, you know, another typical thing, which was having data problems, you know, rows in your data, which are just 
couldn't be true. And if you notice those, uh, you may wish to handle them somehow, sometimes by removing them and sometimes by correcting them. And here we are just very simplistic and even without understanding why it happened, we are removing all rows where we had response times which were not positive, right? And for some reason it happened in the data, right? Maybe a bug, maybe a data a mistake. So we are doing that and then we are grouping by conversation. Maybe here we should just to be more careful, we should have the whole hierarchy of a stream, a topic and a local data. So you see, we're considering a topic thread in a given day as a conversation, just for the sake of this uh, uh, separation of conversations. And as people commented, that is not perfect. There could be conversations that did continue across two days, for example. Right? And we're not handling that, uh, we're not coping with that uh, in, in the purest way here. And then uh, we, somehow we are using some nice uh, properties of tablecloth that allow to have, uh, to enjoy a grouped data set. And we are doing the splitting somehow over the groups in a sense. And maybe let us skip the details because that is more about tablecloth. And anyway, now we have this topic date split. And if we, look into what we created, then you see we have the training set, which has these number of examples, and the test set, which has this number of examples. And you could control that, uh, you know, for example, the uh, ratio of training from the whole, whole data, you could control how things are divided, and there are some parameters to control that. Let us not worry about them now. Uh, any thoughts about this now? I'm looking for the stream. Yeah, no comments in the stream. Yeah, so uh, you see, um, <laughs> we are not even doing machine learning yet. But we are just coping with the data, looking into data mistakes or bugs and, and uh, splitting the data. This uh, phase of preparations, it is, it is part of the life of a machine learning practitioner. And we are just having a little taste of it. Mm, yeah. Now, maybe what we could do a little bit is explore the training set. And it is, yeah, maybe somebody have a com has a comment. Uh, any, any thoughts or comments? I imagine Carsten may have, may have some comments about the current uh, stage where we are at or anybody else. Yes, as you said, we haven't touched the machine learning yet. <laughs> we are still in the- Right, back. right, absolutely. <laughs> in the preparation. Yes, right. Yeah, we will get there probably after the break. Um, great, so so, um, um, so now it is a common practice to not touch uh, your test set while exploring the data, right? You wish to not learn from it too much before testing your model over it. Right, because otherwise you you're cheating in a sense, or you're creating your own biases that will direct you to cases that are that will have uh, some approval in the test phase. And so we will explore just using the training set, and you know we'll just look for some relationships between variables just to get to know our. Uh, columns of the data. So for example, what about this next response time, which is the thing we wish to predict? So you see, that is a histogram of it. What is a histogram? A histogram is this idea of, of counting in bins so that we get some idea of the shape of the distribution. So you see there are some values which are not very frequent, but very big compared to the typical values, which are all here in this range, yellow. We are using this techviz library, which has this nice histogram function and quite a few other nice functions. Um, so yeah, that is the histogram. And you see, when we have something like that, that is so far away from the usual bell shape that we sometimes like, then it may make sense to try 
and transform it so that we get something more bell shaped. So that is what we do here. We use the log transformation. And um, so that we'll get uh, numbers. Why am I filtering here? I don't need to do this filtering, sorry. So that we get numbers which are kind of of a more bell shaped shape. And the, re the reason, one reason to do that is that it gives us possibly a better idea about the range where the numbers are, are uh, kind of uh, distributed. And also um, sometimes, like depending on your machine learning model, it may be better to use that as your target of learning. Uh, you know, the normal distribution, this bell-shaped famous distribution, it appears in nature when you have uh, the sum of many independent things. So at least some of your machine learning models will try to predict your target by collecting a few things in a, in a, by addition of a few things. And things like that will tend to be bell-shaped. And if your target is not bell-shaped, and then there is this gap between the practice you're having and or the, the choice of method and your target. So this kind of transformation is typically useful. Uh, it would be nice to mute yourself if you're not speaking. Uh, it is kind of better for the recording. Um, and yeah, so, so um, yeah, and uh, by the way, why is it truncated here? Because we did truncate uh, it here. Uh, maybe I didn't mention it, but when we define the next response time, oh no, sorry, maybe I'm wrong. Oh, yeah, I see uh, JF, thank you for raising a hand. I'll look in a moment. Um, so, uh, did I truncate it? Uh, yeah, I did truncate it by the number of seconds in a week. So I did not allow very big values of the next response time. And the reasoning behind it is that if we are trying to predict the number of uh, seconds to get a response, then it wouldn't matter for us, at least uh, for the sake of the current uh, conversation going on, it wouldn't matter for us if we, it will be uh, a week or many weeks. Uh, it will probably not be related into the current situation where we're trying to understand whether we'll get a quick response. So the notion of quick response we are interested in uh, doesn't need to look into very big numbers of uh, response times. And it is not obvious to do this truncation, but that is what we did in this research with uh, Sami and Ethan. And so we have this truncated distribution. So that is how it looked before the log transformation. And you see these, these values are all truncated by one week of seconds. And these are after the log transformation. Uh, JF, you did have a comment, right? Uh, yes, thank you. I just wanted to ask you the comparison between the two is histograms. <clears throat> the first one before the uh, uh, taking the log, uh, could you show that again? Yeah, let us show them together. Uh, Oh, uh, okay. Oh. Well, I, my question essentially was the, the the horizontal axis are the bins of the response times, right? Uh, yeah, let us see. Uh, apologies. Uh, yeah, so the horizontal uh, so, yeah. is the number of seconds for the next response. Yeah. Okay, so we see the... Um, my, my only, uh, the, the puzzle, uh, what I find puzzling is that the, the largest bin is on the extreme left because it's the most response times are very short. Uh, Com compared to one week, you see, this is one week. Ah, uh, okay. So essentially, what I, but, but it's the same idea, the, 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 <clears throat> on, the, on the upper uh, histogram, the, the, the shorter the time, the more to the left the bin is, right? Uh, yes. Okay, so yeah. when we when we produce the second histograms, 
uh, it looks counterintuitive because the shortest time is in the center bin, which would you make you think that, oh, I see, it's uh, okay, the center bin is the, 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 the largest, we, it's treated as being zero, being the center value, the value that has the most, uh, the bin that has the most values in it, it's traditionally considered to be some kind of a zero type value. And as this is the, so what I'm saying basically is that the, 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 the center bin, the, the, the uh, in our histogram would make you think that the center bin is an average, it is, a, is a response time that is not the shortest. You see what I mean? On the upper histogram, you see truly that the higher, the highest bin on the left is yeah. as the it, most response in the shortest uh, yeah. the bin with the shortest time in the center, the bin being being in the, the, the number three being in the center makes you think that you know when most people take uh, you know about this much time. Yeah, uh, and that is the, let, yeah. Go ahead. You see what I mean? Yeah, that is the point in looking into the data in a different scale. And yeah, and it does depend on how you've been. So maybe let us look into this histogram function and see how we have how we can have more bins, right? And then maybe it will shed some light here. So yeah, we have these options, bin count. Yeah, let us do it. So um, basically, I, I was just looking for a way to be able to tell well the center bin is response time in the lower diagram. Uh, well, you, we can see that these are much shorter to the the bin, the the, uh, the rightmost bin, and much longer than the leftmost bin. But this is not the case. Uh, if we look at the time scale on the horizontal axis, the x-axis on the lower histogram, yeah. the time, the oh, time, yeah. and the response time. It is another scale. It is a log scale. So this number three, this number three means 10 to the three. It means 1,000. Okay. This number four means 10,000. So they are all in this yellow side of the top uh, plot, right? So okay. all these details we are seeing here at the bottom plot they are not visible in the top plot because they were all happening in one bin there. Very good, I understand now. So yeah, the, thank you. all of the bins to the left of the center bin in the lower histograms are contained in the leftmost bin in the upper diagram. Yes, thank you yeah, so okay. much. Yes, I get it. that thank was an important you. comment. It makes yeah. no, no complete sense now, sorry, thank you. Yeah, that was important, thank you for this. Let us look at this histogram function. I hope we can figure out how to specify the number of bins in this tech quiz library, which is no nice. So bin count, uh, bin count should be an additional key here. Right, it should just work, I hope, but it doesn't. Yeah, maybe here it isn't less important, but uh, sorry, maybe we'll try to just un uh, debug it for a moment. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure why. Really not sure what I'm doing wrong here. So yeah, maybe we'll drop it and I'll try to fix it in the break. And maybe we'll just continue just a little bit before the break to get an idea of how our data look. And then we'll have a break and then we do some basic, very basic machine learning. So, um, yeah, so, so these are these histograms. And now uh, you see we could, um, let us look at the different years we have and at the median response times in these years. So we have this plot um, and you see, just by the median, which is a very kind of rough way of uh, getting an idea of the data, response times were much longer. 
Uh, it would be nice to mute yourself while uh, you're not speaking. Um, uh, right, so you see, um, we get an idea about some difference between the years. Uh, does it make sense? Mm. So, uh, yeah, so looks like 2020 was very active, or in, at least in this sense of the median response time to messages. Um, maybe let us do that for not only for a year, but for a few of the other features we have in the data. So, for example, this column called keyword that basically says, does the message contain a question mark? A keyword question mark that says whether the message contains a question mark. You see, when it is true, it will typically have a shorter response time. Yeah, and maybe it is kind of intuitive. Maybe it makes sense, right? Just checking for comments. Uh, oh, yeah, thanks. Um, and yeah, uh, that is what we saw with the year. Joy, uh, maybe not so strong here. Positive, one of those sentiment analysis features that Sami added. You see when there is this more positive spirit in the message, at least by counting some uh, keywords, then it tends to get longer response times. That is interesting, right? And no idea why. Maybe it means that this column is not so, this feature is not so useful. Maybe it doesn't actually capture positiveness. You see, it is just a very um, initial attempt as, at uh, sentiment analysis. And you see, but what we see is that a few of these features have the potential of being informative for what we hope to predict, which is the next response time. Any comments about that? Here we see a few streams, a few different streams of conversations. Some of them are study groups, other are development groups of certain projects. And you see they have different behavior in terms of response times. Uh, any thoughts about this? We'll continue with just a few more plots. And so, um, yeah, uh, yeah, maybe we'll skip the box plot, which are uh, this way, which is a little more detailed in looking into the data. Um, we can look into other features, which are more, uh, which are, uh, uh, which have many uh, different values, uh, numerical values, and they deserve uh, this view or some scatter plot like view. And you see that not all features have a strong relationship to the variable we wish to predict. Uh, what we hoped to see is a very clear diagonal, right? That is the picture that would say, yeah, there is some clear correlation, so that feature is useful. But that is not, all, not always the case with all these features. Um, yeah, anyway. That is a little taste of the data. And here is another uh, useful thing. Um, oh, sorry, I'll skip a little bit. Uh, this one is useful. That is the relationship between the response time and the next response time. And you see, here we have this diagonal. I'm not sure about what this uh, line here of points means. It looks like a bug, and I'm, I'm a little bit worried about it. Um, it looks like it happens for some reason that these two numbers are equal very often. And maybe I'll try to fix this bug in a moment, but uh, in, in the break, right? Because something is wrong about this. But the phenomenon we are seeing in most of the points is that there is this correlation between the log of response time and the log of next response time. You see, we are looking in these, into these numbers in log scale. And if we don't look into them in log scale, then the picture is less clear. You see, we, we cannot make a sense of it. Uh, and that also means that possibly 
it would be good to use log scale for these numbers in our um, in in building a machine learning model. Of course, that depends on the kind of model you're building. So, um, and we can measure the correlation between these the logs of these two variables, and the correlation is a positive correlation of zero point five two. And yeah, anyway, so that was a little taste of relationships between our variables. And what we'll do after the break is uh, do some very basic machine learning of regression and classification over our data. Uh, but let us see if there are any thoughts or comments before we go for the break. Um, Mm. Great. So is it generally a good idea to use the log scale? So it depends on your data. And there are some um, diagnostics you may run that will give you a hint about uh, whether it would be useful or not. What the log scale does is allowing to allowing us to look into things which are of very different orders of magnitude and sometimes your numbers are like that so it turns out that response times are a little bit like that so sometimes they could be 10 minutes but they could be also 100 and 1000 minutes so if we don't do a log scale then the difference between 100 and 1000 is much bigger than the difference between 10 and 100. And that means that our whole process will be too much affected by the big numbers, the big gaps, even if they are not so frequent in the data. And log scale allows us exactly to kind of linearize this at least in some situations, but you know, 10, 100, and 1,000 become just one, two, and three. So now they are evenly spaced. And uh, this allows us to, to think about different orders and of magnitude as if they were evenly spaced on a line. And it, it really depends on the distribution of data and the problem. Maybe somebody here may, may have better, better reasoning about it or a better way to explain. Um, it is uh, one diagnostic uh, that is kind of typical uh, for this situation is where your distribution looks like this um, first histogram we saw. Well, you have very extreme values, which are not so frequent. And you could, there are some numbers you could compute to measure how much your distribution is skewed in this way. Yeah, but I think Elena is going to comment about it. Uh, no, I was just going to ask, that matters if you're trying to construct some sort of linear model, right? Yes, thank you. Yes, yes. Yeah, that, that comment was needed. Thank you so much. Yeah, so for linear models, or some kinds of linear models, as, as you said, it matters because linear models are trying to add a few things together. And adding a few things together means that we want our target values to be kind of evenly spaced on the axis so that we can cover the whole range just by, by adding a few things together. And otherwise, those specifically those linear models wouldn't be able to work so well. And yeah, other models may not suffer so much from this problem. Really depends on the kind of model you're using. Um, yeah, thank you. That that helped a lot. This comment. Um, yeah. Um, so should we have a short break? Maybe five minutes. Sounds good. So I will pause the recording. Mm. Yeah, um, great. So what we'll do now is look into our data set and do a very basic supervised machine learning, which means machine learning where we're 
learning to predict some target basically um, that is known to us uh, in the training set. Um, and we'll do it in two flavors of the problem regression and classification. Um, and uh, I hope Carsten will uh, comment uh, and stop us uh, sometimes and kind of uh, shed more light on the background in CycloGML and uh, uh, everything around it. And actually, maybe Carsten, you may wish to say something about CycloGML in general. Okay. Uh, yes, it is basically born as an extension of the uh, ex existing uh, tech ML library, which was created by, by Chris Nürnberger some, uh, some years ago already. And it was, so that in that sense, there is very uh, little new code there. It's just uh, an in compatible extension so that's why we needed a new uh, uh we broke a compatibility with the old one and we extended it to pipelines so the old uh, tech ml library only knew about the um, the model itself so it could uh, uh, most of the things we maybe see even today could have done very similar with uh, tech ml before but uh, uh cycloj ml can now deal with a whole pipeline as the let's say, as the object to work on. Before, the, work, the, work, the, the object to work on was the model itself, so regre uh, linear regression or what all these typ the typical models. And uh, the extension was that we can work on a whole pipeline, which could be pre-processing plus the model, typically. Voila, that is the, the history of it. So I'm not sure how far we, we come to that today, but that is basically the new the new thing in it, that the, 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 a little bit the realization that the pipeline should be the object to work on, not the model. This is as well very different in ski in ski in ski uh, how's it called escalate escalate on Python. So escalate on Python itself only deals with the model uh, itself, and all the pre-processing as we see today should be done with pandas and is independent as a step before. And with this pipeline concept, we try to put these together. And the reason why to put these together, the overall end goal is that we can optimize the pipeline in the same way as we can optimize the model. So it is about uh, uh, hyperparameter optimization. All the current um, machine learning tools, they allow to hyper, uh, to, to, to tune, so to optimize the parameters of the model, but not to optimize the parameters of the pipeline. And sometimes that is needed. For example, what we just briefly discussed was, which would be the useful features to use? We can do that partially analytical by looking at these plots and decide which one we want to use, or we let the computer just try it out. So we tell it, try all combinations of uh, uh, potential features and give me the best one. It goes a little bit in automatic machine learning. That is what automatic machine learning does. And so that is basically the extension. But that is advanced, so I'm not sure if we come to that today. I have prepared a little bit, five minutes on that, to look into something which is in the tutorials. If we have the time at the end to see that, uh, either trying or look at the code, uh, we can do that. Fantastic. Yeah, so actually, I guess it is a good idea that whatever I do, I will stop a little bit earlier so that we have time both for Carsten's uh, short presentation and for some discussion. Uh, so since we have 40 minutes for the official time, I guess I will try to do something now in 20, 25 minutes. And when, then we have more time for Carsten's comments and for like short discussion. Is it good? Okay. Yeah, thank you. And so, uh, yeah, maybe I'll share the screen again. And um, I think I was kind of uh, uh, convinced by these, you know, very naive explorations uh, of the last few days uh, that it, it takes time to to have like a good narrative, a good story that allows us to see uh, this library. Uh, um, in like in a meaningful way uh, that teach us about the more advanced things and we, we yeah we will not get to them in this short session i think uh, 
there are three, the, at least three different ways we could go about it. And probably we should have a series of, of workshops that can build upon each other. So one is like experience, uh, the use, the basic use uh, of the library uh, on a, a real data problem. And that is what we'll do today. And that will be very basic. Another thing is to, I think, learn what, uh, learn about pipelines. So there is this notion, which is a very functional, functional notion that uh, CycloGML offers through a library called Metamorph and Metamorph ML. And these libraries offer this notion of a pipeline that um, cast and built. And, and I think to, get to know it and understand the details of how it works, we should spend some time with it. And another thing is to see advanced, uh, some advanced uses of CycloGML, like tuning whole pipelines, tuning over whole pipelines. So I guess today we will mostly do that, just experience the basic use on a real data set. And, but we are really hoping to have like a series of sessions. Um, great, so, so let us look into a regression problem. What is regression? Regression means uh, predicting a quantity, right? Building a model that will uh, learn to predict some unknown quantity by learning it over some data where it is known. And what we'll do now is a basic linear regression of two variables, the log response time and the log next response time, right? And we saw this plot where we saw these two numbers and we saw them in the uh, log scale. So we see in log scale, there is this relationship here, which is a little bit of a, a cloud of points around a line. And this line is an, a mistake. I guess maybe I should filter it out now. I don't know why it is there. Maybe some edge case that was handled, that was happening in the data. So maybe I'll now just drop that. So let us do it. Uh, so um, just as we dropped these cases, let us also um, have another condition that avoids these special situations where uh, um, we require that the response time of a row is not equal to the next response time. And I'll evaluate the whole file again and go back to this plot so that we can see that this troubling line here is removed. And I hope it all evaluates. Yeah. Great. We removed that line, which was probably a data error. Right. So, so we have the response time and the next response time. And this next response time, the vertical, the vertical axis is truncated just because we were not interested in those cases where we were having conversations over more than one week, which maybe are not really conversations. And that is the thing we wish to predict. And maybe let us first see how we write that and get an impression of the whole workflow. And then we just a little bit go into the details of what is actually happening. So we are defining something called a pipeline. And a pipeline is just a function. And it is based on this idea of the metamorph library that we want to compose functions. And we want to compose functions that work over closure maps. And these closure maps, we can think about them as buckets where we put everything that is relevant to the computation and we, we just pass this bucket through the pipeline and it, at every given step somebody is looking into the bucket and maybe changing something maybe maybe adding something to the bucket 
And at the end, we got this bucket, which is a closure map with uh, all the relevant situation at the end of the process. So that's uh, the idea of metamorph, the way I like to think about it. And another central idea to metamorph is that you could run your process, your pipeline, where you're running this packet in more than one mode. And typically, you'll have two different modes where one is called fit and another is called transform. So um, this idea of fit and transform, um, they are these words are also used in this scikit-learn Python library, and uh, they are roughly equivalent to training and testing, but not exactly. The idea is that on the fit stage, we can learn things from the data, like learning a certain model of the data. And in the transform phase, we are using what we have already learned. And we want to build processes that may behave just a little differently in these two modes of running the pipeline. So let us see what we are writing here. So this pipeline, you can think about it as composing functions that act over maps. And we are composing in this order where the first is the first one to be applied. So uh, kind of opposite from the comp function for composition. Right? So first, what we are doing to our data is adding some columns. And you see, we're adding the columns um, in the context of the pipeline. So we are not using the usual table prop functions, but a certain pipeline versions of them that don't act directly on a data set, but act on a data set that is just one member in a map. And maybe I'll not go too much into the details here, but you can think about it not as a passing a data set around as we did earlier, but passing a bucket around where the bucket has a data set in it, but it may have more things inside, right? So these functions act on that. And yeah, it is intentional that we're not going into details, at least for now. Maybe after the session, we can stay a little and dive in into how it works. Then we are just selecting the columns that we care for. Yeah, and actually we are using here another namespace. I guess we could use it also here, uh, the MM namespace is uh, yes yeah thank you thank you so much yeah so this mm namespace if we jump to definition oh sorry if we jump to uh, mm it is this um namespace inside cyclogml that is relevant to metamorph pipelines and it has all kinds of things like that um so we can use it has it all table clause basically plus some additions from techml data set so this all table clause functions are in there and yeah, some more, which were the machine specific functions from TechML does as it. Perfect, thank you. Like this set inference target, for example. So all these functions, they are of this version that doesn't act on a data set, but on a data set in a bucket, or, which is just a closure map that has this data set as uh, one of the members. Uh, in a, with a special key. And so we are selecting col the columns and we are saying, yes, we are marking this column, let log next response time as our target. And, and then uh, I'll skip this line for a moment. Uh, maybe later we can say why it was useful for us here in our, uh, mostly in debugging. And this line says, we want to model the data by the method called ordinary least squares, which is just linear regression, you know, just basically passing a line through the, the data and saying the height of the line that is our prediction for the vertical axis, at least for when we have one uh, predicting feature like here, it is a two dim dimensional picture we can see, and it is just about passing a line. So that is this model type, and we could add more parameters here depending on the type of model. So this 
step, which is here the last step, it is of this special kind where you have two modes, fit mode and transform mode. So when we are running this step in fit mode on our training, we are building a, a model, which is just you know, computing the best line to pass. When we are in transform mode, we are applying this model, for example, to the test set so that we can see how well this line we built is performing for prediction. Just to add here, the other functions above, they behave the same in both modes. Yeah. That is a, that is a little bit the thing, no? So there can be functions which behave the same in both modes, that these are the first three. It's just the last one which behaves differently according the, to the mode. Fantastic, thank you. Just the last one here is special in this uh, different mode dependent behavior. And then let us build some maps and pass them through the pipeline. So for example, here we are beginning with a very basic map and that is typical. Your maps will contain usually at least those two different keys. One is the main data object we're passing through, which is just our training set. So basically those functions that we said that are work on the data set in the bucket, they would apply to this part, which is the data set we put inside in the special key called metamorph data. The other key is the mode. Here we are using fit mode because we want to compute a line. And then we are just applying our regression pipeline to it. And this just computed, it was fast because it is basically in our regression. Uh, for some models in CycloGML, we have a nice explain function that tells us about the model we just built. In this case, we got two numbers. One is called bias, another is called uh, coefficients, where for each predicting feature, we have a number. Basically, what it means is that um, this is the slope of the line we built. And this is where it intersects the, uh, the, the, the y-axis. It is like a, a way of specifying a line we pass, we pass through the data. So these coefficients are a prescription of how to predict, right? Because given any point now, we can just multiply by this number and add this number. Multiply by coefficient sorry, multiply the log response time by coefficient and add the bias, and that would be our prediction for the next log response time, which is our target. Now, any, any thoughts about this before we go about testing? Yeah, just uh, to summarize, uh, <clears throat> when you extracted those two columns, and you trained your model, did you take into account any of the other features of the data set? Uh, so uh, we've had other experiments. There are other features which are informative. Maybe we will have a little look into them, but at least uh, in our recent experiment, this one was the most informative feature. Okay, so basically what you built is a predictor of the next response time given only the current response time. Absolutely, exactly that. And uh, all of the training hookers in the MM model uh, step of the pipeline. Yes, that is the model that computes these two numbers in the fit mode and uses them in the transform mode. Okay, thank you. And one last uh, comment is that uh, the, the line goes straight through the graph. And uh, of course, the training makes the line go as, as to fit as much as possible the data. But would you say that because uh, as, we, as we saw the, on the graph, uh, the dots are all over the place. There's only a very thin minority of dots that actually correspond to, because we're, we're having a line go through uh, a, a graph that's pretty, spread out, although maybe I'm wrong in saying that because a lot of dots are hidden because they're so aggregated in the middle. But uh, we you see that because of the nature of regression testing that we're going to 
miss the mark a lot of times, or I guess that would be revealed during testing, but. Yeah, it is not such a good predictor. Okay. Yeah, you. and, and you know, we'll not look, look into all the details now, but yeah, there is some room for improvement, certainly, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. These comments help a lot. And um, yeah, let us, uh, let us now see how we test it. So what we are doing here now is we are taking the trained context. What is this trained context? What is this structure we created here? Let us look at how it looks, right? So it is a map. Oh, didn't it print nicely? Oh. Uh, oh. There's oh, the yeah. data in. There's the data in, but okay, but it works. Depends how large the map is, how, how large the map is. Yeah, thank you. Yes, so it took some time to pass to the browser. Something I The model is there, the binary of the model. That is the issue. Yes. <laughs> so that yes. can be very ugly to print. Right, yeah. So maybe, maybe just for, to make it a bit uh, easier. So um, uh, let us... Uh, Exclude, uh, yeah. Model as bytes is the issue there. Model, but it's not, it's not super straightforward. Yeah, maybe something like that, yes. Model sort such model as bytes. Oh no, actually it is model date. Sorry, update in model, model data. Yes. Model oh yeah, uh, I'll respond in a moment. JF raised the hand. Model bytes. So now when we print it, it yes, yes. you have model da, model data. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so this one, uh, I guess I'm wondering if, yeah, maybe it took some time to pass to the browser. So the browser was a little bit struggling. And yeah, the browser is struggling. Yeah, anyway, oh, it didn't pass yet. Uh, yeah, actually let us, oh, sorry. Let us print it here in the REPL and see if it prints nicely. Oh, somehow I didn't, I didn't, probably I didn't dissolve the, the relevant part. So yeah, never mind. actually. We have this browser view here and you see it is a nested structure that has not only our original data set, but also other structures that were added to the bucket during the passing through the pipeline and mostly the model that is trained here. And it is, has this, uh, uh, binary representation uh, using the nippy library and and uh, yeah uh, maybe can we jump to the bottom yeah never mind sorry so uh, that is the training context it contains everything we learned during training so now um, when we want to test it we are building our test context and it is built from the trained context so first, as we, in the training phase, we needed to specify data and mode. Here again, we specify data and mode, but we are not specifying them in a fresh new map. We are specifying them by adding them to wh what we have already learned in the trained context. So we're getting this new map and we apply our pipeline to that. So that is the test context. And since the test context is using transform mode, it will not learn a new line, it will use the line for prediction. And now I wrote a little function to kind of look into, into the resulting uh, predictions and uh, compare them to the actual data and do this both in log scale and not in log scale. And let us just have a look at the results for a moment, I think. Um, yeah, I think the browser is struggling. Um, yeah, that is maybe one, uh, let us comment. We're using node space here. And one of the troubles here is that when we are passing big, pa big uh, data to the browser, it is a trouble. That is one of the beautiful things about Clerk, this uh, new tool that it knows how to handle. Yeah. Uh, uh, indeed. indeed, right? Yeah. Indeed, so, yes. Yeah. So maybe I'll now restart, um, uh, restart, 
uh, uh, this tool just so that we don't have to struggle it with it now. And we will pass uh, another structure uh, like uh, this summary we have of the measures. And oh, uh, yeah. Oh, for some reason, it is kind of insisting to keep the old value, and I'm wondering why. Uh, Daniel, I noticed that it's uh, it says model dash bytes, not model as dash as dash bytes. Maybe. Um, oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, That's maybe it. if you do that, oh, it'll no. uh, it'll improve things. Thank you. And then just call, I, and then I think just comment out the, the one above it, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, explain was also useful, but yeah, for some reason, yeah, actually, I am wondering, yeah, how we got into this situation where it is to show new values. Maybe I will not struggle with it uh, for now, so we'll avoid the browser for now and throw it away and just look at things printed in the REPL. And yeah, so let us now print, for example, this result of evaluating the tra the test context. So what, what are these numbers we have here? So you see, um, we compute, uh, there is this loss namespace at uh, CycloGML that has many nice functions to compute uh, performance, um, either loss or accuracy of the models we are creating. And loss means some number that says how bad it is, basically. So the mean square error is um, a way of, of computing. Oh, sorry, I had a mistake here, I think. I should, yeah, I'll just uh, fix that. Uh, oh. uh, so apologies for this. Yeah, the mean square error is one uh, common measure for mistakes. Let us maybe look at the mean square error of logs. So that measures how, how these gaps tend to be, how large they tend to be, the gaps between prediction and actual values on the log scale. And then this number is what happens when you actually compare the values not in the log scale. And you see, we get a very huge number here. So very problematic when we are not in the log scale anymore. And R squared uh, compares this to the variance of the predicted variable. So yeah, let us apply this function again. And uh, you see, oh, why is it? Oh, oh, because, yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I fixed that. And now my editor is stuck. Uh, so I'll kill my editor. Apologies for this. Um, and we'll look into it in a moment. And then we, uh, just in a moment, we will pass to uh, Carsten's presentation uh, just after we fix what was just wrong about what I was showing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll start the poll. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Let's start a new Emacs and see what is happening. So I'm starting the REPL and we just Look for a moment at the correct numbers while the REPL is starting. I'll correct what I was writing, which was wrong there. Um, uh, question. Yeah, so what we should do is. Um, Like that. 
yeah, and maybe let us not worry about it now because maybe probably Carsten has more interesting things to tell. I just wanted to fix this number so that we can get an idea of how these numbers look. And now we're evaluating everything so that it just takes a moment. And uh, Yeah, and so we can see our performance uh, here. So R squared is this number that says how, how much of the variance of the things to be predicted is captured by by our predictions. And here on the log scale, we see that 29% is the num is the part of variance that we could predict. Not so good. Uh, we only used one feature. And this R squared, oh, here is the wrong thing about it. That is compute again. So with, with logs, it was even negative, which means the predictions we gave for, sorry, for the actual response times, not in log scales, they were even worse than just using the average. And so we failed to predict the numbers in the original scale, and we got some decent step of prediction in the log scale, and that was an attempt at very basically in our regression. And we see this interesting gap between log scale and not log scale. And the next step uh, we hope to do that we'll not do today is classification, where we are actually trying to predict a binary thing. Uh, is it going or is it not going to be an active conversation? But maybe we should keep that for another time. And maybe now I'll stop. And maybe later there will be some time for questions. And I guess now Carsten could present a little thing. OK, yeah. yes. Thank you. It's just at the right moment, because basically what I want to talk about is exactly the next step, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically uh, how, how uh, you, you showed how to get the matrix of one model. And the next step is then, what do we do if we have several pipelines, several models, how to compare, how to find automatically the best? That is a little bit more then uh, uh, it goes more away from classical statistics, linear regression to engineering of machine learning, which just says, I just try a lot of different things and I pick the best. So I share my screen with you. Uh, and entire screen share. I think I will, in the, in the interest of time, I will just go, instead of looking at the concrete code, I will look at the I will present the, the, the user guide advance, which contains the code, um, but then we go a little bit quicker. So we enter now a little bit this concept of pipeline evaluation and selection. So one of the next things we, we want to do is then say, yeah, if I have several, several potential models, how do I pick the best automatically? Uh, and this automatic is important if we talk about maybe hundreds of different pipelines, hundreds of different models, thousands of different models. And I want to, I want to, to pick the best. Um, so then there's one new function basically in, in uh, Schicklo JML is the evaluate pipelines function. And this one, it takes instead of one pipeline as an input, it can take several pipelines as input and it takes as well uh, uh, an arbitrary uh, sequence of train test splits. What we have seen so far was one model, one split, because we did one split in, uh, uh, in the code we have seen with, with Daniele. There was one split of the data. But the moment we go to, to uh, more complex uh, splits of the data, um, uh, cross, cross, uh, cross forwarding, so we want to try our model not only with one split between uh, test and uh, train, 
but do that several times because maybe the splitting had an influence on the model performance. So that is good. That goes then in, in, in uh, uh, cross folding. So the uh, ever this one function here, which is important, is the evaluate pipelines function. It is basically takes in several pipelines and several splits, and it does a nested loop over them. So every uh, pipeline gets uh, trained and tested several times over all splits, and the best one is picked. Um, so that is basically a way to to find a best model in a more or less automatic way. So the the, the initial uh, function signature looks then like we see here. So we call these evaluate pipelines and we give it a sequence of pipelines, a sequence of uh, trained test pairs, a certain single metric. And we say if the metric should be uh, is an accuracy or a loss, so if the metric should be maximized or minimized, and then it basically runs everything which uh, uh, we have so done so far by hand. So it runs the, uh, we have seen that uh, Daniela was uh, uh, running the pipeline first in fit, then in, uh, then in transform. So inside of this function, all this happens automatically over all pipelines and over all uh, splits of the data. And it returns then the best model by this accuracy. We can again as well all of them, but the idea is eventually to ask only for the best model. So we can basically give it uh, several pipelines, several uh, uh, parameterizations of the model, because in the code of uh, the Dan Daniele, we, we haven't seen it, but uh, the linear regression function has certain parameters, the so-called hyperparameters, which you need to set to something. And it is often not obvious what should be the best value. So you can one way of dealing with that is just to set it to several and just run this and it gives you the best. So that is this concept of uh, this idea of evaluation and selection. So model selection or sometimes as well called hyperparameter tuning. Is there a question, a question on that regarding this goal which you want to reach? So we want to find in an automatic way the best the best model or the best pipeline that is the that is the goal of the of the next step um there's no question i just go ahead so here in in this uh, advanced user guide the the example i'm using is the titanic uh, uh, example so predicting the survival of titanic is a classification problem so first i start as well with a single pipeline so it's exactly what we have seen before so we make one single pipeline here for this uh, uh, problem we talk about the columns serve survived and uh, passenger class and we want to predict uh, the if, if, if a person survived or not from the passenger class but we use the logistic regression uh, so it's classification but the pipeline is very similar as i said before the evaluate the evaluate model it takes a number of pipelines but we can give it as well one by just making a sequence of one pipeline so that we do here. So we start by being the sequence of the pipelines, just one pipeline, and the same for the models. Uh, sorry, the same for the uh, training data. So the function can take uh, pairs of test train data, but we can as well start with one pair. That is this. So basically what we do now here, we have one pipeline function and one pair of uh, uh, train test split. Very similar to what uh, Daniel was showing. But instead of running the, uh, the, the pipeline by hand in these two modes, fit and transform, we call this function, which does internally the same. So now internally, it will uh, take this one model, which is in here, because we only have uh, one pipeline, so we have one model. We have one holdout, so it will call the fit and the transform exactly one time, and that, re and that and then it then it uh, predicts automatically one given metric. Uh, Daniele before he showed uh, four different matrices. He calculated uh, four different ones. Uh, as here we have the idea of automatically returning the best one. We need to have a single function in order to uh, rank the models uh, by by to come up with the best. 
we can have we can use a built-in function or we could define our own function but we need to have a single function in order to rank them and return the best one automatically so we then we run this one and then we get an evalu evaluation result which is uh, again another uh, rather large map because as i said before we run nested loops so internally it runs over all pipelines all the combinations of the train and uh, uh, test so we have several evaluation results in here in a nested loop so we see this here a little bit that there's uh, a sequence and a sequence and a sequence and the interior of the sequence is the evaluation result which contains as well this context we saw before because before Daniela was showing uh, several times this context uh, this is as well this this full context I wrote here a special function in order to print this context which removes exactly these uh, complicated model data which is this binary data which made the problem with Daniela so I wrote a function which removes exactly that from the result so that we I can print it here on the screen and so we see already in these results that they are the matrix that that, that, that is here the matrix so the, the the one matrix we were asking for is in this result additionally we have means of that because as I said before we are looping over all pipelines and we are looping over all uh, tuples of uh, train and test data and we are often interested in the mean of those so we want to know over all train test splits what was the mean accuracy of the model no that is uh, very often asked to review to have a more uh, to have a more informative metric because if you only use one split of the data, our metric might be biased because it just was calculated on a single uh, on a single metric. Are there any questions or comments on that? So what we see before is exactly the same, just in one uh, what has done uh, Daniele, but just in one function who does the both uh, the transform the fit and then the transform. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, if you yes. had, uh, let's say, if you had uh, uh, 150 uh, uh, functions, pipelines, I meant. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yes. How, how do you look at your result? Uh, is there yeah. a higher uh, of the winner and so forth? Because it looks yes, like yes, it's very it, yeah. Yes. Let's say you have several options because the function can be used for very different purposes. For in, 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 a, in a certain phase, you maybe want to investigate all results because you, if you have only two pipelines, three pipelines, you maybe want to look at this together. At the later stage of a model, you say, I don't want to know all these things. I want that the computer runs for two days and it gives me just the one back. So the function supports both in the sense of you can specify in a certain way which part of the results it should return. First, uh, we see that a little bit later. Uh, the default is that it returns uh, only a subset. There are some parameters here, uh, like this one. We see them here on, the, on this side. So you can say, should I return the best pipeline only? Yes, no. Should I return the best cross-validation only? Yes, no. And you can basically tell it which parts of this very big tree it should drop. This is as well a memory optimization because if this thing runs for two days, you would build up, you would build up in memory gigabytes of information, which would basically make the thing crash. There are certain defaults which I have decided as a balance between enough information and but that is completely controllable by the parameters, here, so that it can work for the initial exploration where you have one pipeline two pipelines two models and you may want to do this look at look at it on the screen or in your emacs uh, by by uh, stepping into the result but it is as well suitable for a very large uh, large scale operation where you basically can say don't return me anything uh, that comes then later you can tell it write the results to disk and don't return me anything so that means it can work really for for several days without building up too much information in memory. We come to that later. That goes then in experimentation of models. 
On a high level, the, re, re, the, the evaluation result contains several pieces of information. It contains the pipeline function, which we have seen as well before. That was the um, that is the function you 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 basically this is the the whole pipeline as a single function. We have these context during the fit operation, you know, because the, the 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 function internally it runs the fit and it runs the transform. So we have the con we have the context uh, how it was at the fit stage. We have the, the metric function. We have the some timing information. How long did it take the, the operations? We have some more information which maybe I don't talk about. Um, and we have um, this is basically the in because the 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 pipeline gets applied against the train data and against the test data every time. No, because as we have seen maybe before, for calculating the matrix, the matrix of the model, the pipeline need to basically run three times in total. We need to run once the pipeline in fit to fit the model. Then we apply the pipeline on the train data and we apply the pipeline to the test data. And that allows us then to calculate the, 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 the accuracy. So the pipeline gets somehow run three times in, in uh, 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 by this function for each pipeline and for each tuple of train test pairs. So there is a, a, a lot of information, but as I said, there are ways to, 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 to get that out. Um, this is, of course, now standardized. This, is, this will not change. This is basically the API of this function, that this is the, this is the information you get out of it. And uh, uh, later out, we print a little bit the key information. For example, um, the, the, the one of the key information we get out is then the matrix. And you see here this nested structure. So the evaluation re result you need to ask for, it's a nested sequence. So it's a sequence of a sequence. So we take the first, then we take the first of that, and then we ask it for the matrix. Good. In this case, both sequences were of length one. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I just want to ask quickly, uh, yeah. when you have many results to evaluate and sometimes you need to study them over a period of time, uh, I saw the map that gets printed uh, with all the uh, keywords you described. Um, is, is there also a, a, a way to get an ID from each result so it can be accessed or referenced quickly? Let's say uh, the model has this ID. I mean, the, 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 the evaluation results for the moment don't have an ID as such. In the yeah, sense so of, so uh, that, uh, it can be, that is, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I mean, all information is in the pipeline itself. So you have all information. Are you talking about to write these things to disk in a certain way, which is one of the things which can be done as well? I'm not sure what you mean by an ID. So the, the, the main idea is that everything which is possibly known on the training process is in this map. Okay, thank but you. This, but this can make the map very large, more than, your, more than fits in your RAM. So that's why you have possibilities to shrink the map so that it doesn't explode your memory. So this is a kind of performance optimization to just not make this map gigantic. At the end, what that what is. So we see a little bit uh, because we run out of time here. Uh, we see as well how we do now the next step. So we would have two pipeline functions. No, before we had one. So now I make two pipeline functions. They are they are very different. They are slightly different only. For example, I set here one of the hyperparameters of this logistic regression model should be different between these pipelines. So I say let's try it with max iterations one and let's try it with max iteration 1000. So now I create my pipeline with pool, my uh, pipeline sequence with two pipelines and I run the same thing. Now the old pipelines is two pipelines, but I didn't change that yet. So it will iterate over both pipelines, do the thing and return 
the double of the results of before. Because before we had that, and now we have that for each pipeline. So it's getting big, big, and big. A little bit what you would do in reality, you would not create these pipelines by hand. The next step is to generate these pipelines. So you could basically iterate over a sequence of the max iterations, which you would like to try, 1, 10, 50, 100, and you generate that. So the next step is then that we make a create pipeline function, which takes parameters and it returns the pipeline. So now we make a function which returns a pipeline if it's parameterized. So basically by doing that here, we a single pipeline can be created like this, but I can now create a lot of pipelines by just, uh, by just having a sequence of 1, 10, 20, and so on uh, to, to go forward. And then we go over grid searching to over all the potential values. I'm going to very quick because that it gets now a little bit involved. But the next step is then that you say, I have a hyperspace of all my potential uh, hyperparameters of my model or my pipeline. And I do a search in this space. A lot of times these spaces are getting very big very quickly. Because if I have, uh, if my hyperspace is try D3 and try everything between these two 100, 100 of them, then I have already 100 times four, already 400 different models. If I have another parameter, which has, uh, again, 20 different values, I have already 10,000 different models to do. So there's a little bit of an optimization for that, which is a kind of grid search. So instead of blindly trying all the 20,000, the Sobol grid search, it, part, 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 uh, it splits this big hypercube in points which have a kind of maximal distance, and I try those first. So I, instead of doing all the 20,000, I do 100, which are a little bit optimized in this cube. So that is, but that is then just to do that is just perfectly fitting into this concept because I just have a function which calculates me all my pipelines. But this, this one stays exactly the same. So now I'm saying here, I have now uh, 20 pipeline functions. I have again my, my split as before. Uh, and now, um, and I see here, for example, these are the different matrices for all, uh, the, the average matrices for all the, the 20 different uh, uh, models. So one model had an accuracy of this, one model had an accuracy of that, one model had an accuracy of that, and so on. I say here that I don't want to return only the best, so it returns me all of them. If I would set these flex here to true, then it would only return me one, the best model. So this shows a little bit that it is meant for both use cases. One is exploring, in which I maybe want to see these all. But the moment I have 10,000 of hyperparameters, I don't want to see these all anymore. I just say, hey, give me the best. And then I set these flags to true, and it would only return me the best. So here we get then basically, in this case, I just sort this by the metric, and I get the best model. So the, met, the best model I have has a metric of uh, uh, 7.9, so an accuracy of 7, uh, 0.79. But we have as well have the mean classification over all faults. So this is basically the result of the best fault. But sometimes, but typically we are interested over the, the mean of all faults. So we want to select the best, net, the best model, not by the best by the best accuracy, but the, by the best mean accuracy that we can get as well. And we can get the best model because the model is in here as well. So we just take the best model, which is in this case, it is the model object, which is a Java class because uh, Ski Closure ML below, below is using a, a, a Java machine learning library. So we get the best, uh, uh, the best model as a, as a Java object. And we can get these coefficients we saw before uh, or we can get the best pipeline function. So this were the best parameters. And then we can use that for predicting new data. Sorry, I was very, very, very quick. 
just wanted to show that in this way we can automatically find the best model. So this enters a little bit the automatic machine learning. Are there any comments or questions on that? Uh, yeah, a quick question, sorry. Yeah, uh, yes. The, you just mentioned that uh, the uh, Java, Java library is backing the uh, yeah. the, uh, the ML uh, yes. tra training. Is that the training and the testing, everything? The Java library, does it, it do It's a library. It, no, it's a Java library of models. So that is basically, uh, uh, it's called uh, uh, Smile. It's a okay, Java library. It's, it, it's the sure. Java library of, but Ski Closure ML has a concept of plugins. So other libraries can be plugged in as well. The, let's say the standard plugin, which comes with it, is based on Smile. Okay. And Smile has, uh, has all these different models. And the, I see. So, so in theory, the, in theory, the, you could, uh, let's say, you had a, a very powerful or a large graphics card, you would be able to leverage that. Yes, yes, because we did plugins with a deep learning library. Smile itself doesn't have deep learning models, um, but we have plugins to to some uh, uh, deep learning frameworks for for Java. Uh, so they work exactly the same way, um, but, and they would then use a GPU. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Smile itself not. Smile itself not. We have as well a plugin to the XJ Boost uh, library that is as well using the, the GPU. But I just meant want to add before we close. Um, I haven't seen, I haven't shown this here in the in the code as such. The, we, one interesting thing we can add here as well is a callback a callback function, which gets called by the framework on every model, uh, on every single model after it was evaluated. Um, so in this case, if we would do 200 evaluations, it would be called 200 times. And then we can decide what we do at that moment in time. Uh, we, get, uh, we get basically this whole map in this callback function and we could for example write it to disk that map uh, um, and then we can additionally the function to return anything so that means that in practice this function doesn't need any memory because we don't keep anything no because there will be the callback the callback writes these very large thing to disk, and then we forget about it, so it doesn't stay on heap. And if we then if we, if we then pick the these ex, these these uh, these things here in the right way, that we basically this, that we that uh, we that we dis, disassociate everything from the return result, that would then then allow that this function can run for days without exploding the memory because it will not remember anything. It will be completely stateless and we will write all the models to this. So we can, that allows then really, really very, very large scale experiments which run for days. And then of course, you have the information on disk in the form of uh, uh, whatever we decide to do. Then we need to write some other code which works with these the results which were written on disk just to show we can go without changing anything in the code, we can go from in-memory exploration to uh, yeah, large scale running of gig gigantic searches in the space of all the models where everything basically happens offline with all the disadvantages. Yes, we don't get then a nice map back we have the things written on disk, so we need to write some other code which reads then these things from disk, but that scales infinitely. You know, it, is, uh, it scales, uh, uh, yeah, as it doesn't keep anything in memory. There are some examples for that. That is basically by just giving here a, a handler function which gets called and which can then do whatever it needs to do to, to uh, write these things to disk.
Any other comment or question? Okay, then it's back to you, uh, Daniel. Carsten, I'm so happy that you could um, that you could uh, add this uh, part that allows us a little bit of the advanced uh, view of this library. Uh, you, by the way, you are still sharing the screen if you wish to stop ah, sharing. Yes, and, yes. Uh, that was so wonderful. And I know we are a little bit over the, the official time, so maybe we'll conclude in a moment. Just want to say that it was really so important for us to have this explanation that you know I couldn't do, and also it is anticipating the coming more advanced workshops. And what CycloGML does here is so magnificent, not only because it is so comprehensive in documenting things and organizing all those plugins, but also because this functional approach simplifies uh, the way to look into workflows. And, and that is such a relief after having to do such things in scikit-learn, for example, in Python, where it is very much object-oriented and, and you know, often very much a trouble, at least for me, to write complicated workflows. And, so yeah, it is like an opportunity to say uh, thank you to Carsten for this wonderful library and also for the explanation. Um, so uh, I, I guess uh, we could conclude, uh, I guess, the, the official part. And maybe if a few of you could stay, we could discuss a little bit. Uh, and uh, thank you also, Elena, so much for this session. Um, oh, I'm just sitting here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, can stop, I can stop the recording if that's the point where, where unless somebody else wants to say something that should be recorded. I mean, did, did you stop the recording or? Not yet. <laughs> okay. No, I mean, I could a little bit comment that, uh, uh, let's say the, the, overall, the overall advantages of getting a little bit into this extra work of, of doing the, the, the pipeline instead of, let's say, using standard closure threading macros, you only see it in this very last step. Uh, because then it pays, it really pays off that the, that the pipeline, it is a self-contained thing. So you can just take a full pipeline, you put it into this function, which tries all these pipelines. You are sure that you don't have any references to, to some global, some global data because, uh, and that it only pays off at this very large step. So that is why, uh, it's a little bit difficult to, to, to see that. Uh, while we while we are not there yet, which means on the other side as well, if somebody only wants to do linear regression, maybe ski closure ML is overkill. In that sense, no. If you if you are sure that you want to stop there, but a, a, let's say a classical Kaggle approach needs both, no. A classical Kaggle approach. The last step is the hyperparameter optimization. Everybody needs to do that. So you spend a part of your work in manually exploring, ta, ta, ta. but then at a, moment, a certain moment, you swap to the automatization because you say, from now onwards, I cannot think anymore what is better. I just need to try everything. And it, the computer tells me the best by a given matrix. And that is the one I will submit for the, for the competition. Yeah, thank you. This is this is really um, I think this is great. I don't do machine learning professionally myself, but I can see how this can be very very useful. But but we were a little bit struggling, uh, Daniel. Remember, in the very beginning, is yeah this this interleaving of the exploration phase with the pipeline there no that is a little bit uh remember in the very beginning we were even wondering because it is true that to bring everything together in this one pipeline function 
has of course this huge advantage that we can look at the pipeline on, on, on one page on the screen and we see what it does. But how do we interspear that with plots? No, so it is a little bit a question of using a notebook type of interface to explore our thing versus a machine learning engineering thing where we want to have a CAG file, which we run on the command line, which runs all these things, and we don't care on the plots. There's a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a workflow question, of a workflow question there, but as well as then a tooling question, because the moment I come to, to, to evaluate uh, 50 models, I don't want to be, I don't want to be in node space anymore because node space is not made for, you know, running things which take hours to evaluate. No, no, uh, so we, this is, this is a little bit a, a, a tendency I see there or as an issue, which is maybe interesting to, to discuss now in the group. So the exploration of data science of machine learning versus, yeah, the pro versus running it at scale and ask the computer to just give you back the best model. Would it be possible sure. to use the callbacks to generate graphs and then display yes. them? Again? Yeah, that is one way to do that. That is basically exactly, yes, yes, you have all information there. That is basically how, how the deep learning frameworks work. They, 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 they produce, while they train, they produce these learning curves. No? And that is possible via these mechanisms because all information you get in the callback, all information is there. You can do anything you want. The synthesis, or I don't know, the simplest one way could be you just serialize the, all the models on this, so you keep them. So you have the model object as such for usage. Another one is you serialize exactly the information to, to generate uh, uh, learning curves. It, let's say the framework doesn't make there any, has there any opinion on it. I implemented one example of these handling functions, which writes the data via NIPI to disk. But that is an example, not, not more. It depends on your, your concrete use case. But that, again, the moment I do that, I'm not in node space anymore. You know what I mean? Because I, I'm, I don't want to see plots anymore, I, I, at least not the, the type of plots we looked at today. We are in a phase that I want to run on large scale uh, uh, kind of hyper performance computing even. I want to just that it tries all these models with all these different hyperparameters and it gives me the best. And I have decided before what I mean by with the best. Mm. Yeah, and maybe uh, um, one thing that we could discuss a little bit after the recording ends is uh, our plans for next workshops about this. Uh, as much as people can stay a little bit, if some of you could stay. So I would love to hear some comments about that too. And yeah, and in these topics that Carsten mentioned, they deserve so much more exploration. And I guess it might be good to, to maybe end the recording here so that we can have some time for a little more further discussion, unless there are any other comments uh, 